Vibrant, vibrant, vibrant music teaching. Proven and practical tips, strategies, and ideas for music teachers. You're listening to the Vibrant Music Teaching Podcast. I'm Nicola Canton, and on today's show, we're talking about awards, rewards, and incentives. If you want to read the accompanying article that goes along with this episode, you can go to vibrantmusicteaching.com slash 141. Welcome to April, beautiful teachers. All this month, we're talking about motivation on the blog, and that will be our theme for our upcoming issue of the members magazine, Bright Notes, as well. In this first show, in our motivation theme, I want to take a look at rewards, awards, and incentives in our music studios, and what the difference even is between those. So we're going to be unpacking what those different terms mean, or how I would define them for music studios, and how you should consider using these things in your studio. Before we go any further though, can I ask you for a wee favour? I would absolutely love it if you would share this podcast with one other teacher that you think might like it. Remember, this is not specific to piano teaching, so if they're a teacher of trombone or band or anything else, they might enjoy this podcast, so consider passing it along. Incentives or incentive programs are one of those kind of marmite issues in music studios. If you're a teacher that uses some kind of incentive program, you probably swear by it and think that everyone else is mad for not doing it. And if you're someone who doesn't use one, you probably do so pretty vehemently. Yeah, there are grey areas in between, but many teachers stand firmly on one side or the other. So before we even talk about these different aspects of these types of programs and awards and rewards, let's just take a moment to open our minds, okay? Let's take a moment to start with a blank slate. Try to set aside how you feel about it, or even more so, try to set aside what you currently do. Because we can all get so tied in and stuck with what we've done for a while or what we believe in right now. And I want you to go into this with a fresh slate. We're going to start with incentives or incentive programs. So first let me just define what I mean by that term. When I talk about incentives, or most teachers talk about incentives, it's not just in the literal definition of that word. Just like when we say things like assignments, we mean something quite specific with incentives we do too. We normally mean some kind of structured program or structured system for keeping track normally of practice time, although it can be of other practice goals or other goals and accomplishments within the studio. So the most common practice incentive or studio incentive will be something that counts up the minutes and possibly logs them on some kind of sticker or stamp chart. There are variants on that, there's all sorts of themes, but when many of them come down to it, that's what they really are. Now, some of you may also consider things like my challenge board to fit into this category. If you're not familiar with my challenge board, this is a kind of wall of fame in my studio, so it's a poster that goes on the wall, and many other teachers are using it now as well, which is awesome. And it has different categories, Uh, so there's different levels of scale challenges, sight reading challenges, all these sorts of things. Students have to work hard to achieve certain things within that category in order to get their name in that section of the board, which is why it's like a wall of fame. Now this is different to many incentive programs because students are working on a specific challenge at any given time. Everyone isn't doing it at the same time, and there isn't really a linear path. Yes, the levels go up, but in many different areas, and each one is kind of its own encapsulated thing. So it's quite different to the typical practice incentive where you're logging minutes or logging pieces learned or anything like that, although some of them incorporate that kind of aspect as well. So I will talk a little bit more about where I see that challenge board fitting in and why I use it towards the end of the episode when I've explained these various terms, but just bear with me on that front. So, should we be using Piano Studio incentives, incentive programs? Should we be using a structured practice incentive in our studio? 
Well, I think that question comes down to how you're using that incentive and what its goal is. If its goal is to increase student motivation, I'm going to go ahead and say, nope, that's not going to work. It's not going to accomplish your goal because the student is going to be motivated to the incentive, not to the thing that you want them to be. Motivation is not transferable in that way. The only way the motivation transfers is if through the incentive program, your student learns to love the thing that they're being incentivized to do. So if there's something extremely unpalatable in someone's perception of it that actually will be fun or engaging or interesting or motivating in some other way intrinsically within that activity once they start doing it, that's one thing. But that's not what most studio incentives do. And so in order to motivate students, I think you should be looking elsewhere. What I think studio incentives can be great for, if you frame them right and go into it knowing that this is your goal, is building studio community. There are some beautifully themed incentive programs out there where students work together to build up, say, points, which then contribute to giving money to a charity or something like that. And if you do that kind of incentive and all of your all of your discussion around that incentive is about you all pulling together, basically, is about working together as a team and talking about the other students, I think they can be wonderful for bringing together your studio community. That's probably not one of your primary goals for your students. I mean, it could be an important goal for your studio. But I just wanted to clarify what I think incentives are good for. And I think that's a great thing for them to do. But for individual student motivation, I don't think it's the best idea, if that's your goal. Now let's talk about rewards. Many incentive programs will end with rewards, but so will other things that you might not consider a structured incentive program. So a reward is something that you know you're going to get if you do a certain action, and then you do it and you get it. It is predictable. Okay, so if I tell you you're going to get five red jelly beans if you practice five minutes a day every day this week, and then you do it and I give you five red jelly beans, I think that is a reward for the thing you do. In other words, rewards are basically a form of income. (laughs) They're money. You're promised them in order for doing something. And when you see them in that way, they can start to look a bit dirty in the studio, can't they? Not that money is a bad thing, and definitely for adults it's not a bad thing, and maybe sometimes for kids it's not a bad thing either. But should we be paying students to do something that they're supposed to be passionate about? And no matter what the payment is, whether that's jelly beans, or little trinkets from the dollar store, or money, like gift cards, or actual money, or fake money, like Beethoven books that many studios do, or praise from you. If it's a reward, it has a lot of danger flags associated with it in my mind. So have a think about whether something you're doing could be classified as a reward. And then think about, again, your goals for it. Let's take an example student. Let's say you have a student called Stephen, right? And Stephen hates scales. And so that you decide that you're going to offer Stephen a $5 gift card to the local ice cream shop, which he told you he loves going to, and that his parents won't always let him go to, won't always pay for the ice cream. So Stephen's going to get this $5 gift card if he practices his scales, all of his scales that he's supposed to be doing, every single day for two months. That sounds like a bargain on our end, uh, end, doesn't it? For that amount of scale practice. Okay, now let's say Stephen does that. That seems like success. But what was our goal in the first place? Was it to get Stephen to practice scales for two months? It's likely it wasn't. It's likely that's not enough. We wanted Stephen to learn to practice scales as a habit, or to learn to enjoy scale practice. And two months 
it doesn't matter the length of time. It's not enough to build a habit if you hate doing it and don't see the point in it, don't see the value of it to you. So unless that incentive or reward is combined with a way to make Stephen see the value of scales, get something back from them, or find a way to genuinely enjoy them, it's not going to happen. He's going to get to the end of those two months and you're going to be not just no better off, you're going to be worse off going forward in the long term with Stephen. Because here's the thing, all you've taught Stephen through that process is, yes, he's got a bit better at scales, right? But the other thing that you've taught him is that scales are something that he needs to be paid to do. And ergo, he shouldn't do them if he's not paid to do them. Let's take a separate thought experiment, okay? Let's say you have a friend and neighbor called Alison, okay? So Alison is really busy. She works even more than we do, if you can believe it. And Alison tends to work from like 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. She doesn't go get home until after 7 p.m. And she does this six days a week, including Saturdays. Now, Alison has a little problem, which is that she, when she has post, when she has boxes delivered and things like that, she's never home to receive them. And the problem is she's also not home to go pick them up because she has to go to the depot to do that. And so you step in and you offer to pick them up when you're picking up your own and she has to sign the back of the slip and that's all good. And you do this a few times for Alison. And then Alison said, listen, I feel so bad about you doing this all the time. I really appreciate it. I especially appreciate it when you do it right away because I often really need my packages. So how about I repay you each time you do it? How about I pay you a sort of a delivery fee every time you go and get my post? How did this make you feel? How do you think it would make you feel? You were doing it as a favor to a friend and now it's been changed. And there's an implication here that you need to do it faster than you were doing it and that you're then going to get paid for it. Okay, so let's say you buy into this and you say, you fight her on it at first, but she's pretty insistent and you know she's feeling guilty. So she, you let her pay her, you this little delivery charge. And then she decides that one time she isn't going to pay you or she forgets to pay you, right? Are you less or more likely to do it as a favor for her now? Getting paid to do something changes the motivation be- behind why we're doing it. It changes how we feel about what we're doing. And the longer we do that, the more consistently it changes that, the more embedded that change becomes. So going back to Stephen, you get to the end of your two months. If Stephen hasn't learned to love practicing scales, or he hasn't found a use for them that is relevant to him right now, he's less likely to practice them after getting that ice cream voucher. And anecdotally, you may have a situation where this really did transform things. But I really want to encourage you to look at it over the long term because the research suggests that it doesn't work over the long term. It only works in the short term. And that's not the game we're in. We're in the game of creating lifelong musicians, not two month scale practicers. (laughs) That doesn't achieve our goal as teachers. So I just want you to tread carefully with rewards and always be thinking about the goal. And sometimes it is a case of getting a student over that hurdle and a reward might actually get them there. Sometimes you need them to get ready in a certain time frame. They're not going to be motivated to do it by themselves, but they will be motivated by the result to continue on their musical journey. And that might be okay. Personally, the only reward I ever use in my studio is praise. And when I use praise in that context. I don't believe praise is always a reward, but it is when the student is, when that's the main motivation for them to do something, which is actually often true of our students. If we have a good relationship with them, they often do things to please us. And we need to be cognizant of that fact. We need to be aware of it and don't treat it too lightly, our praise that we give them. So sometimes it is a reward and sometimes it is a reward in my studio even though we might not always frame it that way, but I don't give out any physical rewards to my students. No, definitely no candy. 
and no little bits and pieces either. Lastly, let's talk about awards. So obviously it shares several letters with the word rewards, but they behave quite differently. So first let's unpack what an award is in our context. So an award to me is something you receive for an action you take, like a reward, but it's something you do not expect or do not have an assumption that you will get. If you think about an award, you know, a literary award or the Oscars or anything else, Someone can't go into something with the motivation of receiving that award as a guarantee. It's not a payment. It's an accolade for, or an appreciative mark, or an acknowledgement of the work you put in, but it is not sort of a contractual agreement in the way that a reward is. An award in a piano studio is something you give to a student to acknowledge what they put in, the work that they have done towards something. It needs to be something that is occasional and unexpected, truly unexpected. And that does mean it needs to be an infrequent. It should not be something that becomes a reward where students are working towards that moment when you're going to pull out the lollipop or whatever you give as an award. Almost doesn't matter. But If you do it too regularly, it becomes a reward because students come to expect it. The real use, though, of awards in the studio is not just for us to show how proud we are of our students. Honestly, although we feel like we're doing that for our students and we want to show them how proud we are, sometimes we're actually taking things away from them by doing that. And it's really, we're doing it for ourselves. We want to to have this physical manifestation of how proud we are of the wonderful work they have done. And I know, like, I'm not chiding anyone for that. I get that. I feel that too. But sometimes we're doing it for slightly selfish reasons, actually. (laughs) The real reason, though, to give an award that is actually useful for students is as a physical manifestation, a memento of how proud they are of themselves for achieving that thing or doing that thing, or putting in the work that they did. So, to come back to the challenge board, this is why I see the challenge board working so well in my studio and in other teachers' studios. Because the student gets to come into the studio and look at that challenge board, or look at the sticker on the front of their practice folder, and feel proud of themselves again. They get to revisit their own pride, their own feelings that they had. And we can even talk with them about that to further bring that to the surface. It's that opportunity for students to reflect on their own work and to say out loud or say to themselves or both, wow, I put in all this work and I'm so proud of where I got to and I can't wait to see where I go next. And that is the best possible use of any kind of incentive award or reward in our studios. This is a hot topic, and I know you're going to have opinions, and maybe you're going to disagree with me pretty strongly, let's say, on some of these issues. I would love to hear all of your different opinions. I want this to be an open conversation. So please do hop along to the article that goes along with this episode. That's at uh, vibrantmusicteaching.com slash 141. Leave a comment there. Let us know what you think. Or join in the discussion in our Facebook group that's at the Vibrant Music Studio Teachers Group. I'll see you there. Looking forward to some hot discussions and debates about awards, rewards, and incentives. If you liked this episode, you would absolutely love Vibrant Music Teaching membership. We have the support and the training you need to take your teaching further. Join us today by going to vmt.ninja and signing up.